Welcome to the Terminology Leading Practices stream of SNOMED CT Expo 2023. My name is Liara Tatina and I'm Customer Relations Executive for Asian Pacific and Global Education Lead at SNOMED International. I will be moderating this session. All questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. Online attendees, please use the Q&A button to type your questions to the presenter. On-site attendees, please use the microphone provided in the room. I'm now pleased to introduce Matthew Cardell from CSRO, from CSRO, who will be presenting collaborative development of a radiology request set. Matthew, please go ahead. Thanks, Liara. Um, and I promised Alistair I wouldn't go over time today because I know that I'm the only thing between everyone here and um, the welcome reception. So I'll get into it. Um, so this project evolved since we originally put in the abstract. I think the outcomes and the learnings are still very similar to what we had hoped we'd get to at this point, but I'll talk through how that's evolved. Um, it originally started middle of last year. We were approached by the college to do some work developing radiology sets, but since then it's evolved to become part of the large fire accelerator program, which um, you might've heard colleague Kate talk about it. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail about what each of those stages of the project were. Um, but it's, it's ongoing with this, then there's lots of challenges and opportunities that we've learned throughout it. But um, the whole idea, I guess now, especially with the Sparked program is that it's a bottom-up approach with the community developing these things and having the colleges or the clinical experts involved is a really key part of that to make sure that what we build is something that they want to use and that that's useful. Oh, the screen down there too. Uh, we've, so, so I've had a lot of experience over the years working with different industry partners to build different solutions for different things. And one of the things that I know that we've learned and witnessed is how involved subject matter experts, especially the clinical experts are involved in different projects can really drive how successful they are. Um, and I've broken down here, there's roughly sort of three ways you could categorize how different projects traditionally might've involved their clinical experts. And the ideal one, is where you've got the clinical experts, they're the ones that have come up with the requirements and approach to better solution because you've got buy-in that they're receptive to whatever you deliver because they've said, we've got this problem, we need something built for us, help us, you build it and they go, it's great, it's done. The middle one is probably what a lot of things are where, and I've put solution architects in um, quotes there because it's really any sort of like a government project thing where somebody in their ivory tower or wherever it might be has come up with a problem they want to solve. The clinicians are involved, but they're often brought in as the subject matter expertise. That's not necessarily the clinicians that are driving the project. It's maybe a government agency or some, somebody who's identified a problem and they said, we need experts in to help. So that, that approach is still good as well. And that's what, what a lot of um, projects need to be. Um, but the final one is, the can colloquially say it's building something and throwing over the fence and hoping that the clinicians like it. And you only really bring in the clinical experts to effectively act as salespeople to, to spruik it to their colleagues and say, look, we, we've developed um, this reference set, like you should use it, but they're not really, haven't got any skin in the game. So they, they don't know, it's hard to get everyone convinced to use it that way. So hopefully most of what we do falls into those first two categories because Ideally, you, you want the clinicians to be the ones that are pushing these things, but sometimes it is it does need to be a government push thing or by a higher agency. So to start off with how this project commenced, um, last year we were approached by the college, so RANSC is the, yeah, the Australian New Zealand College of Radiologists, um, and they wanted to develop some code sets for requesting, and they did it, identified that they wanted to use SNOMED, um, and Sarah was brought in to provide some expertise just around um, navigating the terminology, how it could be distributed, maintenance changes, things like that. So we we helped them work with SNOMED. They, they were the ones that sort of driving what they want to do with it um, and try to come together. So initially, the first part of the project focused on just a small prototype and the idea of that small set of about 40 con uh, procedures was not to build something that was usable, but to build out what the process for the larger set would be so that we didn't go and try and build a thousand test catalog and realize halfway through that we'd gone down the wrong path and picked the wrong codes and 
all that sort of thing. So the prototype was really about designing the process rather than um, coming up with something that was able to go live and be um, in production. So we've got that, that they've come up with a plan of attack and um, now we're trying to scale that out to, to a production level uh, codes that want to be developed. However, from middle of this year, um, we launched in Australia the Sparked Accelerator. So it's a community uh, led uh, project. So it's co-governed by, I think uh, I'll get the acronyms wrong. I was on the first one, but the, the federal government has, so SARA is involved. We've got the Department of Health and Aged Care. Uh, they're providing the governance and the policy that sort of drives the adoption for this. And then we've got the Digital Health Agency, which um, provide input as well. And like I said, the fourth one, Ruben will correct me if I forget, it was HL7 Australia. So that the four groups together are co-leading this, but it's very much bottom-up community developed. So um, I said, it really kicked off in August, but we've had um, at least one connectathon. There's another one next month. And so that they're regularly scheduled throughout the next, it's a two year program. Um, they're regularly scheduled to try and test these things out. Um, and what else was gonna say about that? Oh, and so yeah, everyone's a co-partner. So um, the, there's regular working meetings for these where everyone gets to say, um, we're going through the specifications, working out what needs to be added, what needs to be removed, what the constraints might be. Um, and it's a really like nice transparent process. A lot of it's tracked on GitHub, so people can raise issues about the specifications if they don't like. Um, the discussions are all there. Um, upvoting issues that they want to introduce to the changes. So that's now where we're at with it. So I mentioned um, industry leaders. We've also got pathology labs involved because the Spark program really, one of the, the outcomes that we want to have at the end of this is uh, an e-requesting program. That's still being finalized, but Spark will design a bunch of, uh, the keynote this morning mentioned the US core data interoperability standards. Um, we're going to develop the Australian version of those. And again, they're based off the international uh, fire resources, but they'll be reused through everything. So we'll have similar resources between radiology requesting and pathology requesting. Um, and another benefit too of having this in the fire spark program now is that we've got wider community involved. It's not just led by the colleges. We've got uh, the primary care providers involved, the vendors involved, because they're the ones that have to actually adopt these specifications. Um, so only having one peak body isn't enough. You need to have buy-in from the, the top and the bottom of the, the whole requesting chain. Which brings me to our first challenge is the, the pre and post coordination um, discussion. So there's no right or wrong answer for these, but these are some decisions that we're having to make as we go through this about what we wanna do with the terminology. Um, in the context of radiology requesting, I've simplified it to, it's traditionally the post coordination approach is thought of as I've just said three um, code sets. So we've got our modality one that will have our modalities like X-ray, ultrasound, MRI, sight, body sites, and laterality left, right. Um, we could put a bilateral code in there as well. Compared to the pre-coordination one where we actually have to have a specific code for each of those procedures we wanna do. With post-coordination, the idea is it's a, it's a mix and match. You can um, have smaller sets. You have more sets, but they're smaller, but you can do a lot more with it. Um, there's pros and cons of each of them. And interestingly, they're, they're sort of the opposite benefits for one of the um, negatives of the other. So the obvious benefit of post-coordination is that you've got smaller sets. So just in that little small example, I've got three code sets. Um, that gives me coverage for 19 different procedures. You do get higher coverage for a smaller amount of content. So there's less likely to be gaps because you're not relying on the terminology to have a code for every single procedure. Uh, another benefit is there's direct triggers for the clinical decision support. So if you wanna have triggers that say um, exposure to radiation, you've got a code directly there that says these are the radio, radiographies. Um, if you wanna do things like body sites, those site codes are directly available. 
the negatives are that um, you really need to understand the concept model. And um, so the example I've got at the top here with some of the decisions about which body sites do you include, um, it seems simple if you don't know what's in the terminology. And like, if we just say we want to take a X-ray of a, an upper arm, do we choose for our body site? Do we want structure of humerus? Do we want the bone structure of the humerus? Entire humerus, the upper arm. This whole thing of do we want gross anatomical regions? Um, it, there's a lot of choices to be made there. Um, the next so I've got examples of these on the the right. The, the next one is um, that complex procedures are more complex. Um, when you've got something that's particularly the interventional radiology, and it, so that's typically where you've got an imaging procedure that's assisting um, a surgical procedure. So uh, an angioplasty of the left femoral artery guided by fluoroscopy or the guided biopsies, things like that. It's really hard to fit those into those three box categories. Um, and so then we get to how we're actually going to do this post coordination and um, like you've got considerations about positional grammar. Um, I've got a couple of examples here and both of those are saying the same thing, but have formed a different um, querying you need to classify then to work it that you're saying the same thing. Or there's options of just concatenating the codes together. So you could just um, say the, the last example here of MRI ankle left and put them like that. Uh, you also need to think about what the information model is, which um, I've got in a couple of slides that helps guide the kind of pre and post coordination you might do. So we go to pre coordination and the pros and cons have flipped around this time that pre coordination is simpler to implement. You've just got one thing, you've got a list of codes, you attach it to a drop down box or search field and the codes are there. The complex procedures are covered. Um, they don't necessarily always have to be fully defined, but no matter how complex it is, you can attach one code to it and it's there, it's in your list. Um, and you can support synonyms as well. So if you've got SNOMED on the user interface, you can have um, these different sort of ways of phrasing a bone density scan. The users can search for it using the terms they want without having to pick and click and pick from different boxes and things like that. But conversely, we've got the, the opposite things that pre-coordination has um, a requirement that all the terminology that you need exists. So if you've got a thousand procedures, you need to have a thousand codes in there. So that's a consideration. Um, and then the attributes need to be extracted if you're doing clinical decision support. So if you want to do that um, radiography alerts for X-ray exposure, um, you need to be able to query out that information from the model. So to help our clinical users navigate these decisions. We added an extra screen onto, um, hopefully many of you, most of you are familiar with the SNMED UI tool. Um, we've got a fork of that where we've added a radio, radiography requesting screen and it's just a mock-up with some search fields. And the idea is that it shows how both of these things can work either together or separately and lets people feel for what the terminology can do. So just talking through this example, and you can go to the screen and play around with this in your spare time if that's what you wanna do in your spare time. Um, so our first, if we start from the, the top left there, we've got our modality thing and you can choose from that drop down box, the, the modality. So in this example, I've chosen MRI. Then you go down to the target site. You can choose bone structure of femur from our site listings. And we've got some radio buttons for our left, right, and bilateral. Now, simultaneously, when you're using this tool, the large box on the bottom left corner, that's actually populated with all of the imaging procedures that are in SNOMED. So there's, I don't know, 12,000 codes or something there. Um, as you fill in those other boxes, that pick list shortens. So because I've populated these other fields, I'm now left with a choice of four codes and they're all MRIs of the femur, of the left side of the body. Um, and it's useful to note that it includes the bilateral because inherently um, bilateral procedures include the left side as well as the right side. Um, I think if I clicked the bilateral on this radio button, it would have filtered that further. And then coming at the other side of the process, um, these little boxes on the right here 
show that we can extract those attributes from the prequel noted code once we've selected it. So I've selected MRI of FEMA and we can use um, some ECL and fire expansions in the back end to pull that back out. So I can see that the modality for that was uh, magnetic resonance imaging and that the site was structure of bone of the femur which you can see is different from the site that I selected up the top, which was bone structure of femur. And this brings us to information models. So this is probably the most important thing that often gets forgotten about because we all get excited about terminology, but without knowing where the information is going, it's hard to make any valid decisions about what, what it's going to do, where, what you need to do with it. So, at the start of the project, there wasn't a specific information model that was in scope. And so how the terminology would be used wasn't really clear. And there was also discussion um, with a third party CDS provider that would use the terminology to provide prompts about smart requesting, like best, best practice of in this sort of condition, what should you do? But we also weren't clear about what their information model was. So we didn't know how we were going to store it, what they were going to do with it. And, that really makes it tricky because you've got to make these decisions and if you make the wrong ones then one side or both sides of that equation might not work so while it is possible it's extremely difficult and really you're just grabbing around in the dark making up stuff so fortunately as i said the spark program came along and with that we get these are all focused on existing resources that are based off um, long-standing, uh, the reference information models, those sort of things that are built out. We, we can extend it, add more to it, but at least now we've got, we're building the e-requesting will um, leverage the fire service request resources. That's, I guess, the main thing we're really interested in for that. And already we've got um, at least three codes to work with. We've got a service code, which can capture procedure. And we've got a couple of other codes. We've got a body site that can capture just a site code as well. And then there's body structure, which I think is a more of a um, data group that lets you say a bit more. You can embed some laterality and things like that. So you've got a few options there already that you can do a bit of post-coordination in the body structure or pre-coordinated code. Um, and then there's more sites that we could add more as the project evolves and we decide what we actually want to do with this model and how we want to capture the data. So once you've got this, then you can start making decisions. And Again, it's not really about whether we only have post-coordination or only have pre. It's that spectrum of, right, what do we want to do with the data? Do we want to um, support? What CDS choices do we want to make? What analytics do we want to make? Importantly, how, how is this going to work on the clinical interfaces? Do clinicians want to be picking from three drop-down boxes to, to choose a code or do they want to pick one? Um, all those things play in. And then how does the, the labs, are they able to receive three codes or do they need to receive one code? So somewhere on that spectrum, there's a, a line. I don't know what it is yet because we're, we're still in the process of this, but you make start making these decisions about whether we choose post or pre. Um, and so ultimately it's how many value sets do you want and how many are required? And finally, um, I just want to touch on some of the content challenges within SNOMED. And this isn't really anything new. Anyone that's done anything knows that SNOMED's got this long, long history and there's lots of... Um, challenges within the content. Uh, the first one that the radiologist picked up and coincidentally, Snowman International have, I think, already or will address this by the end of the year, I think, is just the naming of x-ray procedures so that when they're looking through this, they notice that there was a range of different terms that were used, some variation in how um, x-rays, plain x-rays, radiography, arguably are the same, are they different? Um, there's also some implicit meanings there. I think one of the things that's my learning through this, because I'm not a radiologist at all, um, was with the fluoroscopies that often that's implying that it's a guided procedure because they're real-time video Im images. So it's usually there's some implicitness there that isn't in the FSN, but the radiologist said, well, usually these are guided procedures, but we haven't modeled that in SNOMED. Um, some of the modeling of existing content was inconsistent. And that comes back, probably the main thing for that was the sites I noticed. And it's that thing that over the long history, there's been these choices of some procedures might focus on a bone structure. Some might be just saying it's an arm. Some might say it's the tibia fibula. It, it's all this range of how specific it is. And so that impacts too some of these decisions that we make along the way. 
And then the last one is really just content coverage, which I don't think is as bad as um, some users might say that it's missing a lot of codes, but we're still in the process of validating what coverage we do have. Um, we've, the college is developing a reference catalog based off inputs from some of their members. And we'll do some mapping exercises between um, single codes, multiple codes to see what, what's missing. Um, I think the last we look, we're, we're looking at 60 to 70 percent as a minimum coverage at least and um, some of those that's largely from automated mappings um, i think that'll improve manually because a lot of it is just the term matches like auto mapping is really heavily dependent on the language that's there and you might be missing one slight spelling and it just doesn't auto match so the nrcs are limited in what they can do so any sort of content issues we find if it's modeling we'll feed that back through to snowman international but we are adding in our descriptions, which is a common thing that we've been doing in Australia to help snowmed on the interface. So it helps people search for what they want um, using local synonyms and making sure it's consistent presentation, just looks a bit nicer, but also consistent experience. If some acronyms are there and some aren't, it's, it's a bit unpredictable of how it behaves. So finally, um, I just wanna say that the clinical governance is key. So having clinicians involved to really help be, you, you don't just want them to try and sell the product or just get them in as SMEs. You want them to be champions of the work. So involve them as much as possible. If, if they're involved, they'll tell everyone like this really is good. We, we've had a say all the way through the process. Um, develop and define either use cases or your context information model. Have that happen either before you start the terminology development or in parallel, because sometimes you might have information model limits that are limited by what the terminology can do. So those two things feed together. Um, be prepared for content challenges. I think anyone who's done um, at least one project in SNOMED knows that there'll be challenges, but they're, they're not insurmountable. Um, and implementers have, have them involved as well. You, you can just have the clinicians, but the implementers are the ones that need to do this. So they need to be able to say, well, we can do that in our software. You could have some terminology solution, specifications even. Um, it's great to make those up, but if you haven't got vendors that are willing and prepared to implement it, then um, it's gonna be an uphill battle to get that adopted. And that's all, thank you. Thank you. Matthew will now take questions. Uh, as a reminder, if you're in the room, please use the microphone. No um, one question, uh, well, starting that we are doing a similar thing in Estonia right now, uh, but we're not, we, our starting point is not SNOMED. We have a national uh, code list for that or national radiology classification. And we are trying to enrich it with SNOMED. It's, we haven't really started, but it, we have been investigating if that would be possible. So, and also there is like the request part of it. So what, what is the value set you allow to use or also the information model for requests, but also like what, what is in the result, which is yeah. probably more granular. The request does not equal the, the actual procedure that was performed because obviously the GP would never know the tiny details. Yeah. that the radiologist knows. So have you looked into how to make those information models match or what would be the implication of... Uh, we, we haven't yet specifically on the radiology work, but that work um, has happened with the pathology work. So they've got a catalog pretty much that exists now. They've got about 1300 codes for requesting and they have a series of link values set of link code sets for reporting. And that same problem exists in pathology that someone can request one test and they might get two reports back or they might request two different tests and they get one report back and having those line up um, the industry still can't agree on what they how that matches and some of that is just how it works some labs do things slightly differently and um, I haven't seen that the how we're going to do the resulting for radiology yet that's coming along but um, it does exist with the diagnostic work of and yeah the industry struggles to agree on a standard way of doing that, but I haven't got an answer, but I agree it's a problem. <laughs> and another one uh, that also is, I think, very relevant for request is, and probably it affects your implementers more so is how would you 
have, have you got any feedback if they would like to use this request value set combined with their booking system because they would need to be able to book different machinery for yeah. different... Uh... That's one of the use cases we've got, not for the initial requesting, but it, it supports that, um, particularly for radiology, because if you've got a request for an MRI, you can only get that done at a building that has an MRI in it. Um, so there's talk that maybe we have a national service catalog where the patient's got a request that says, I have to go and get this procedure. They can type it in and they'll say what, what providers near you have offered that service, um, which is a bit different to pathology because they just take the blood and they can send it anywhere. They can send it overseas. Um, so that's yeah a specific one that radiology has knowing who does it, but we won't be building that. That's something that I think the, the industry might evolve around, but SNOMED can support that definitely. Uh, Matt, I was really interested. That, that was really sort of like presentation, but I'm interested in the implied meaning. You mentioned the fluoroscopy guided, but that also could possibly uh, be percutaneous, transluminal. Yeah. Have you had all those conferences? No. I'm working on it. I need to know. <laughs> I know. And that's what I would, we, we, we want to try and um, get some of that detail there so that we can feed that back to you to say, because like, these were just ones that came up in the, yeah. the first day when we looked yeah. at it and they said, oh, when they're explaining to me what all these things were. And so I yeah. sort of, in my head, I simplified it as that what we call, everyone calls x-rays is really plain film, but yeah, yeah. x-rays are the photos, thoroscopy is the videos, and CTs are the 3D models, but they're all radiography. Um, so. And the other questions are around the devices. So angioplasty, cutting balloon, balloon dilation, blah, blah, blah. Do we need that much detail? Do they want all that detail? I mean, I, I need to know those yeah. kinds of answers. That yeah. would help us a lot in what we're doing. No, definitely. I'm hoping we can get that. But I'll talk. The thing, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> have it on this just to simplify it, but the, the other, there's like a fourth set that's mentioned about contrast. And really it, it ends up from looking at it, it's usually just a Boolean value to say with or without contrast. Um, we've We've got suggestions that I think it's on that UI tool. I've got a drop down box that just lists all the contrast material that's in SNOMED. It's just some types of contrast material. But the radiologists have said that usually that's a decision they make, not the requesters. The requesters don't. So you usually... wouldn't put it in your request. You'd just ask for the procedure. Yeah. And they might make a right. choice about yeah. what, what they're looking for, what they'll yeah. use. Um, that's usually the provider will make that choice. There might be some specialists that do, but we'll work at that. But it won't. We definitely won't pre-coordinate with all the different chemicals that use for contrast. So, yeah. No worries. Um, yes, you can actually. It's the last session, so we can. Hi, I'm Inga, technologist from the Netherlands. Yep. Um, do you have an example of a question you would ask for a clinical decision support? So, yeah. So the one that the, the tool that they were looking at was more about um, guiding the best practice. So saying somebody presents with a certain problem, that maybe they've got abdominal pain, and this tool will say, well, as first case encounter, you should do uh, maybe an ultrasound first to, to see what's going on. And then if you can't find anything, the next thing you should do is send them in for an x-ray. Like um, that sequence of what the industry has agreed is the best. Se Clinicians still ignore that and say, I'm going straight to an MRI. We're just going to go all out on this patient. But um, that's what this sort of tool would guide that process. But also things like I mentioned that the radiation exposure. So there's some rules about how, what's a safe level of radiation for patients. So if you're able to code that they've had this, they've been getting an x-ray every week, um, maybe they've had their rec more than their safety dose of x-rays for this year. So lay off the x-rays for a little bit or... Those sort of things. So that that they're the kind of two examples that we sort of work around. Yeah. And have the radiologists asked for that themselves? Or? Yeah. So that's they've got guidelines to say that um, this is the a safe dose for it. Things like even um, for pregnant patients about what procedures they shouldn't get because they they're going to be exposed to more radiation. Things like that. So it's just a tr trigger then that if a requester's picked a code and you can say, oh, that's part of one of the radiographies that's going to be a radiation exposure. Be aware of that. Thank you. It would be interesting to uh, ask this in the Netherlands as well, because we're also thinking about pre-coordination versus yep. testing. And you can do both. Both things work for everything. It's yeah, how you design it and how do you use it.
Thank you. So, Thank you, Matthew. Thanks. With that, we will conclude the session. Thank you and goodbye.